Okay, let's discuss some of the updates from the moon. Although focusing specifically on various missions, the ones that are still going on or the ones that are about to start. And actually when I'm making this video, we're only about two days away from a major mission by China. The Chang'e 6 mission that's essentially going to be launching to the moon in order to retrieve first ever samples from the far side of the lunar surface. Which basically means that by mid-2024, we're going to have physical samples from the far side that's probably going to be sent to a bunch of labs around the world in order to figure out what's in them. But the reason I wanted to start with this is because 2024 seems to be a super exciting year for a lot of lunar missions, and it might be even the year of the moon. Ironically, this was also the year for the spectacular solar eclipse, so maybe nature was giving us a bit of a hint there. Anyway, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's discuss the lunar missions once again, talk about what's going on with Japanese mission, which doesn't seem to want to die, and talk about the upcoming NASA missions that are going to be doing something exciting as well. But first, let's I guess finish with the Chinese Space Agency. On top of the mission that's about to launch, they actually also released something super important. The biggest and the most detailed map of the lunar surface in the highest possible resolution. And to be more specific, a geological map of the moon showing us every major formation, every major basin, rock type, crater, currently known to be present on the moon. For example, there are approximately 12,300 craters identified with extreme detail, on top of very detailed maps of various rock formations and even tectonic maps that were previously unavailable. And by itself this is actually a huge deal, because this allows a lot of different agencies to start planning their missions with a lot more efficacy, knowing exactly what to expect when they land in a certain location. And this, by the way, is available to everyone and is eventually going to be even available online in a very similar way to Google Maps. And though obviously the main purpose for this is to help China conduct its lunar missions in the future, including the construction of the International Lunar Research Station that's planned for mid-2030s, the main point is that the satellite is available for everyone and presents the moon in a way we've never seen it before, at least in terms of detail. This was actually done by approximately 100 researchers working for over a decade, so this definitely took a lot of effort. But I know in the comments below there are going to be a lot of comments uh, basically mentioning China in a very negative way, so let's move on. Let's talk about Japan. Everybody loves Japan, right? Yay. Anyway, Japan. So Japanese rover, the one that basically landed kind of a little bit upside down, um, surprisingly, is not dead yet. The Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM, sometimes also referred to as the Moon Sniper, basically only had one purpose, testing new technology in order to land somewhere super precisely with just a few meters of error. And it actually managed to do so really well, landing within about 50 meters of its destination. Except that at the last moment one of its engines failed and it landed upside down. But Japan kind of still calls it a win. And that's because it was able to deliver two additional rovers that were able to conduct their missions, we've discussed this in one of the videos in the description, and it was also able to conduct its primary mission to some extent. And specifically, as soon as it's landed, and as soon as its batteries became operational, even though the solar panels were not facing the right way, it started taking snapshots. And specifically, snapshots of various rocks revealing their spectroscopy. And here we actually see various rocks named after various Japanese dog breeds, like for example Shiba Inu, or here's a rock named Aki Inu, whose pictures now can be used to analyze the rocks in order to answer the main question the mission was trying to answer. The origins of the moon. It's trying to discover the clues about the origins by comparing the minerals of moon rocks with the ones on Earth. If they match, the Theia hypothesis is probably correct. If they don't match, we might have to do some explaining and some additional simulations. But you only expected a picture of one rock. They basically got 10. And so they're super excited and are already conducting various studies. Those studies have not been finished yet. But this was done months ago. And after this, the lunar night came and everybody kind of expected the lander to maybe stop operating because during the lunar night, temperatures dropped to minus 130 Celsius, minus 290 Fahrenheit. And in these temperatures, most of the modern technology starts to basically crack and tends to expand or shrink dramatically, destroying a lot of components. Once again, the video in the description talks about this more. And so everyone expected that back in February of 2024, this was going to be it. The last picture 
the last data, and it basically reported back the day after, the lunar day, which usually lasts for two weeks, which means that it continued its scientific observations and kept taking more pictures. But then it survived the second night, and now the third, which makes this literally the first ever lunar lander to have survived three lunar nights even though it was never supposed to. Here's the last picture it transmitted to planet Earth. And because there are no heaters here, and no insulation to protect electronics, we don't actually know why it's still alive. But it's still a huge success for the Japanese space agency, and potentially has some super important engineering lessons that a lot of agencies should probably investigate. Something about this lander makes this kind of indestructible. In contrast, around the same time we had the private landing by the US company with the Odysseus lander, and it never became operational, just taking a few shots like the one you see right here. And this was a highly anticipated mission by NASA, and unfortunately it didn't succeed. And so something about the Japanese lander that just makes it a little bit different. But that's of course the missions on the moon right now. We also have so many more planned for the rest of the year. Now obviously we have the famous Artemis mission, with the Artemis 2 potentially launching in November of 2024, but it's most likely going to be launched in 2025. It's currently not doing so well. There are some issues and unexpected concerns. But NASA is going to be launching the very cool Viper mission, or Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, that's going to be an exciting rover exploring the surface, and as the name implies, looking for volatiles. It's essentially going to be exploring the South Pole in the late 2024, in order to discover water, possibly carbon dioxide, maybe some other ices, or a lot of other resources for potential future manned missions. By itself, this mission is going to be super exciting, and we'll probably discuss it more once it actually happens, and here's actually roughly where it's going to be landing. Then, a little bit prior to this, NASA is also going to be launching Lunar Trailblazers, a satellite mission that are going to be orbiting the Moon in order to measure the temperature on the surface, and to essentially map out locations of a lot of different water deposits, once again for potential future missions. But on the same rocket there's going to be another intriguing lander, the lander containing a drill. This is known as Prime 1. And it's essentially going to be testing a drilling operation in order to extract water from within the lunar surface. This is actually just a test of the drill in order to see if this can be later used for additional missions. Now obviously this is not just for water extraction, it's going to extract a lot of other stuff, but this is just a test for now. And interestingly, all of this happening pretty much near the end of 2024, all at the same time. As you can see, both the Prime 1 and the Viper locations are in a very similar region. Which basically highlights that NASA is about to really kickstart its lunar exploration once again. A lot of different missions happening at the same time, all with one single purpose. Discovering the best location for a manned mission, and for maybe a potential colony later on. Now we'll actually discuss a lot of these missions once they're a little bit closer to the launch date, because for all we know they might get delayed or maybe even uh, cancelled, although that's kind of unlikely because they're almost finished. But honestly, I'm actually more interested in the discoveries and the science done by these missions, not so much in the actual rover or the actual drill. But all of this of course suggests that a lot of countries are super interested in finding a way to explore the moon, with the moon now basically becoming kind of like Antarctica a hundred years ago. Basically a kind of a seventh continent for all of us to explore and for a lot of different scientists to conduct research on. Not so much for conquest and not so much for basically resource extraction, but instead for collaboration and international research, just like Antarctica. And so hopefully it stays this way and actually hopefully it leads to additional discoveries and incredible international collaboration. I'm secretly hoping that maybe NASA and China finally kind of shake hands and maybe do something together, huh? Maybe? If not, that's okay too. But it'd be cool. Anyway, on that note, once we have some additional discoveries about lunar missions, or something else comes out about the Japanese mission that just does not want to die, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, Support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.